So by now I'm sure all of you must have seen all the pictures of the black hole, both the M87 star and the Sagittarius A star that had been published by the EHT. So in this video I'm essentially going to talk about the technique through which you can take such photos of the black hole. And this technique is called VLBI or Very Long Base Line Interferometry. So back in July we had this amazing experience of visiting the Haystack Observatory at MIT which is in Westford. So Haystack is one of the leading sites of the Event Horizon Telescope and that is where you have the correlator or the master computer which acquires and processes the signals from all of the telescopes that EHD has all over the world. So the reason why we are interested in VLBI and the EHD is because as I mentioned in my previous video, we here in Queens are building a balloon-borne VLBI station. And this project of ours in the future will be a part of the next generation Event Horizon Telescope. Our balloon will fill up the gaps in which you cannot have physical telescopes that we get a better coverage. Also balloons since they are so much high up in the atmosphere, they are not really affected by the atmosphere. So you can do much high frequency observations, which is one of the main goals of the EHT. So before even going into the details of black holes, EHT and VLBI, I would first like to talk a little bit about the electromagnetic spectrum as a whole. So what we see on a very daily basis and, and what you have been seeing on a very daily basis, all the beautiful pictures of galaxies and stars are essentially taken by optical telescopes. Optical telescopes capture optical light and optical light is a very small tiny part of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum varies from very high energetic the high frequency waves or gamma waves at one end of the spectrum and on the other end of the spectrum you have the low frequency waves or the radio waves. Now certain processes in the nature emits different kinds of radiation, like different energies of radiation. So based on the energy that they radiate, the frequency of the light will vary from one process to the other. For example, the sun, as we know, during the daytime, there is so much of sunlight hitting us, which, which is a part of the visible sunlight that we, that we see and that we feel. The sun also has its radiation pretty much all throughout the electromagnetic spectrum. So if you had an instrument which was capable of detecting the electromagnetic radiation from the different part of the spectrum and if you if you could point that towards the sun you would observe that the sun glows not only in visible light that we see on a day-to-day -day basis but it, but it also glows in infrared ultraviolet rays and it also glows in radio waves now what kind of a radiation a source will emit depends on the kind of a physical processes is going within that particular system let's say a very energetic process is going in the universe you have a supernova explosion or when you have a black hole which is surrounded by an accretion disk and it is radiating away such high energetic events will always be observed in a very high end of the electromagnetic spectrum like the gamma rays or the x-rays on the other hand if you observe extended sources like a galaxy as a whole molecular clouds nebulas and all of those stuff they essentially radiate mostly in in the radio so what i'm trying to say here is we astronomers depending on what we want to study uh, we look at a different part of the electromagnetic spectrum and not one instrument can do all of those uh, together. An optical telescope which we use on a very day-to-day -day basis cannot look at sources which glow bright in the radio, right? Radio dish can never essentially see an optic, uh, see the optical light coming in because it's not designed that way. Personally, I study molecular clouds and these things emit in the radio and the inf infrared. So I use radio telescopes which are specifically built to pick up these signals. Not only molecular clouds, there are tons of sources which glow bright in the radio and all of these sources requires you to have a radio telescope in order to study them and probe them and get all their characteristic features. So radio telescopes are special instruments which can pick up all the radio waves. All radio waves have a higher wavelength as compared to optical light. So when it comes to telescope, be it optical or be it radio, one kind of an analogy that really helps me understand about this is, is a bucket. If you leave a bucket when it's raining, bigger the bucket, the more rain you'll collect. The smaller the bucket, the less rain you'll collect. So telescopes are essentially buckets, but they collect light, light coming from a very specific source on the sky. The bigger the dish you have, the more light 
you will collect and the more information you'll get about a particular source. Frequency to which a dish is sensitive to depends on the construction of the dish and how precisely the surface is constructed. Now, when the radio waves coming from a particular source at a particular direction comes and hits the radio dish, the, the way that the dish is designed is all of the waves will hit on the curved surface and then reflect onto the focus of the dish. The construction of the dish is made in such a way that the path traveled by each of the radio waves is essentially same. So in that case, what happens is all of the waves, they add up as they travel the same amount of path and that causes a constructive interference, which I'm pretty sure a lot of you have studied back in high school. So when that happens, all the waves sum up by, by a big amount and you get a very bright signal. Now with all of that it's and bits of information out of the way, let's start focusing on imaging a black hole. Now black holes are unfortunately or fortunately really far away from us. So the nearest black hole is the black hole at the center of our own galaxy, which is called the Sagittarius A star. Almost all of the galaxies in the universe has a black hole at its center. Now, since these black holes are at, at the center of all of these galaxies, they're actually surrounded by a lot of material. Now, that might be good for someone who is trying to study the nature of the black holes and how it affects the surrounding environment uh, of, of a galaxy and how it shapes that particular galaxy. But on the other hand, for someone who is trying to image that particular black hole, for him it's a pain because you're essentially trying to spear through all that dust and all that mass in order to image that particular black hole. Make things more complicated, these things are really far away. So you would need a very large dish. Now here we have one particular problem that the Earth's atmosphere is, acts as a filter. The shortest wavelength that can actually pass through the Earth's atmosphere is 0.87 millimeters and 1.3 millimeters. Now if you look at the formula of angular resolution that I was talking about uh, in a more mathematical term, you see that it's the wavelength of the light that's coming in on your radio dish divided by, by the diameter of the dish. So you see how the analogy of a bigger diameter responding to a smaller angular resolution comes into picture. Earth's atmosphere is allowing only a, sp a specific radio waves to pass through which is 1.3 mm and 0.87 mm. Now if I try to put this on my equation. Now keep this equation in your mind. I'll, I'll keep it somewhere on the screen uh, over here. Although these black holes are really big but they are far away. And due to this, they have really small angular resolution. A typical angular resolution of the M87 star, which, which was imaged by EHT, was two times 10 to the power minus nine degrees. You see, that's a really small angular resolution value. If I plug those two into this equation above, you would see that the diameter that I require to image such a black hole is essentially the size of the Earth. And so far, this is pretty much impossible to construct and build. So smart people out there, they came up with this uh, idea of using smaller radio dishes spread all across, all across the globe and making a big dish out of it. This particular technique is called interferometry. Now, very long baseline interferometry is essentially a different version of, of this concept. This is the formula of the angular resolution once more. So it's the angular resolution is lambda by d, d being the diameter of the dish. If I split my dish and make it into two small radio dishes and keep and keep it away by some distance, uh, let's say b. b I'm calling as the baseline, baseline meaning the distance between the two dishes. My formula essentially becomes d equals to lambda over b. Now you see one interesting thing that, that happens over here is if I make my B bigger, my angular resolution essentially gets smaller. So this is the exact concept that those smart people came up with and now which is being utilized by the VLBI. Now imagine you have two dishes separated by a distance B as I mentioned before and you have a point source let's say which is an astronomical object on the sky. Now depending on how far the dishes are, your angular resolution will get smaller and smaller which means you can look at the finer details of your source. Now these astronomical signals are really far away. So when the light comes towards us on the earth, they essentially become flat waves. Now, now you see when my radio telescopes are separated by some distance B and the light is hitting on it, there is some sort of a geometric delay that gets introduced. Very initially I was talking about this interference and how 
the waves of light they travel equal distances uh, and sum up to create a constructive interference but in this case what's happening is this radio telescope the light has to travel some extra distance which can very cleverly be calculated by this particular formula if you, if you notice this now using this formula we can essentially trace back uh, how much extra that light had to travel and that gives us a very essential piece of information about my source as I was saying, uh, the dim delay between the two signals essentially introduce a shift in the wave, right? And depending on how much the wave has shifted, you can actually tell from which direction the wave is coming. I mean, which also gives you a little bit of more information about the source that you're looking at. So if you were trying to observe a big source, let's say a galaxy, what you would do is you would put your antennas pretty close together, which means you do not need that kind of a higher angular resolution in this case, because you're sort of extend, uh, looking at an extended source. Now, for an astronomer like me who wants to study very specific features of the galaxy like, uh, like a molecular cloud, a dust nebula, or something like that, I would need to spray apart my dishes so that the value of the angular resolution falls and becomes smaller and I can look into much more smaller parts of the galaxy. Now all of the delays in each of the baseline is essentially taken and computed in a very special strong computer called the correlator. I could explain about the correlator in this video but I feel like this is getting pretty longer already so I would be happy to make a very dedicated video on correlator and explain that later but essentially what it does in all the delay informations from two of the telescopes and combines it and and creates the fringe like patterns now the strength of the signal is essentially rep represented in these fringes so let's say you had n number of radio telescopes spread all across the world the number of combinations of baselines that you can form from one to the other is n into n minus one by two each of these individual baselines will produce these interference fringes now what this correlator computer does combines all of this fringe, uh, interference patterns together and forms this image of the black hole or any object that you're trying to measure so you see by just using a really clever technique of time delay which essentially introduce a phase delay in, in the signals we are so cleverly being able get to get so of, much of information yeah. about our source now if you add in more antennas in your already existing network you're essentially increasing your number of baselines and you're filling in more information for the image so the more number of these fringe patterns you have from a pair of antenna and you have let's say multiple number of pairs like this the better you can fill in the space and the better image you can recover so so that is why EHT as it's also planning to increase observe at higher frequencies is also uh, another goal of them is to fill in this gap and a balloon bond radio telescope like ours can be really useful for this particular application and that's the reason why we are so much interested in building this particular project because such thing has never been done before so this would be one of its kind so i would like to end this video over there although i feel like a lot of you might have a lot of questions about all of which i spoke before so in that case feel free to comment down below whatever questions you have and I will try to address them in my future videos. And as I said earlier, go follow me on my social media handle. With all of that being said, I'm gonna end this video right over here, uh, but I really hope to catch you guys on the next one as soon as I can. Thanks.